Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone. I am Batista Pap, and what a program do we have in store for you today as we talk about the late American sleeping prophet Edgar Casey. Casey is the most documented psychic of all time. He lived between 1877 and 1945. The Casey database consists of 24 million words and 10,000 different topics. So it's an incredible source of information. Uh, Edgar Casey has been called a sleeping prophet, a man of miracles, a seer, a mystic. He talked about medical di diagnosis, but he also predicted social change. For 43 years, Edgar Casey gave psychic readings. Nearly everything imaginable has been explored by Edgar Casey in his material, including prophecies of world events. We talk about Edgar Casey today with Kevin Todeshi, and Kevin is the CEO, executive director of the Edgar Casey Foundation, ARE, and ARE stands for Association for Research and Enlightenment, and also Atlantic University. And um, Kevin is also a noted author with about 25 books. Dear Kevin, it's so good to see you. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on the program. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, um, it's, it's so fascinating, everything that you're doing. Can you um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Edgar Casey? How did it all start for you? Sure, it started for me when I was in, actually in high school. I had uh, gone to what, what we call in the United States Boys State. It's a, uh, the American Legion has a program where for boys and girls, they don't go together, it's separate. They, they go off to college for a week and they learn about the government and how the government works in terms of the judiciary, the Congress, uh, the executive branch. And so one of my high school teachers recommended me for Boys State. I went to Boys State and honestly, after about three or four days, I was kind of bored with the program. So I went to the student bookstore. Uh, this was 1975 and a book had just come out called uh, uh, a Prophet in His Own Country, The Story of the Young Edgar Casey" by Jess Stern. So I got that book and I was fascinated. It. I read it the remaining time I was there at Boys State. And when my parents came and picked me up, uh, I was living in Colorado. I, I told them I need to move to Virginia Beach and I'm supposed to work at ARE. And that really became my goal in 1975. And I have been involved with the Casey work for the last 45 years and finally moved here in 1982 when I graduated from college. Wow, so it was uh, love at first sight, we can say. It, it was some kind of a recognition or affinity or, uh, and, and including an amazement of this man's life and work. And, and that amazement has stayed with me uh, for the last 45 years. Even, even, recently, even though I've been involved for such a long time and written quite a number of books, I still find things of new interest and uh, kind of like an aha moment uh, even now. So the, the material is definitely fascinating. So um, Casey was the most documented psychic of all time, or is the most uh, documented psychic of all time. Um, how, uh, how come, why was he so exceptional? Uh, why did he have such uh, accurate psychic powers? Did you ever, um, you know, think about it? Or did you do research on that? Why, why was he so good? So the, let me talk about two different things real quickly, yeah. the documentation part and then his accuracy. Yeah. So in, in terms of the documentation, one of the things that really uh, helped to make this work possible was in 1923, he hired a 17-year-old stenographer named Gladys Davis. And Gladys started keeping stenographic records of everything he said and eventually started a vault. And actually, when I started working here in 1982, Gladys was still here. Gladys was alive until 1986, working well into her 80s for the Casey organization. So all the documentation we have, the 24 million word database, all that material is really because of Gladys. And it's because of Gladys that we remain the most documented resource of information. In terms of Casey's own psychic ability, Casey suggested that uh, with reincarnation, we actually take our talents with us. We take our uh, abilities with us. Unfortunately, we also take our biases and our faults and our uh, problems unless we've healed them. But Casey suggested that he had been a psychic many times before and that he basically would pick this up again and again and again. And interestingly enough, he suggested 
that in his lifetime, just prior to Edgar Casey, he had been a, uh, he called it a never do well, a, a guy who had come over from England as a British soldier, uh, essentially got uh, captured by Indians, escaped, and then became kind of like a, uh, a wandering hunt, a hunter and gambler and a womanizer. And Casey said he had been very psychic in that lifetime as well and had used his psychic ability essentially to gamble and to pick up women. And because of that, this time when he gave readings, he had to put himself to sleep, go to sleep on a couch, Casey said, in order to set himself aside. So we take our abilities with us. Casey said his ability as a psychic really started about uh, 10,000, 12,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, and uh, it had been with him ever since. It is interesting that Casey had these uh, accurate, very accurate uh, predictive abilities, and at the same time, uh, his whole life, he was sort of struggling financially. Um, do you have an explanation yeah. for that? Sure, absolutely. Part of the financial struggle had to do with the, the life just previously where he had misused money, gambled, misused his psychic ability to try to make money. And so this time he had a very challenging time. I mean, he had to really kind of make up for that. But, uh, you know, there, over and over and over again, even though he had a financial challenge, whatever he needed to get by eventually came through. So I know that's not an easy way to live your life, just getting enough to get by. But he, he never made a lot of money off of his psychic work. Uh, when he was alive, uh, they just well, just before he died, they decided that if they could raise, th th this work was operating on about $3,000 a year. And they decided that if they could raise $30,000, they could support the work in perpetuity. Today, we spend almost $30,000 a day keeping this work going. So mm -hmm. I, I think he would be he would be overwhelmed with how this work has grown, mm -hmm. how the property has grown, how we've got two educational programs, a university and a massage school, uh, an enormous spa programming all over the country. I don't think he imagined how big this work would grow after his passing. He also predicted accurately, um, I believe, the stock market crash of 1929. And there were some um, hotshot uh, Wall Street people that also came to him for uh, ad advice. Um, and you are basically saying that it was karma that caused him not to try financially in, 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 in this lifetime. Uh, wasn't he frustrated about that? Because he was helping so many people and even pe he was helping people financially, the Wall Street people. So was he not frustrated about it or um, was he okay, you know, okay with it? Well, he was definitely frustrated about it. And the good news is he had tremendous faith. And so I think his faith kept him going, but he was frustrated. He had uh, one of his biggest backers was, was Morton Blumenthal, yes. a young Jewish stockbroker who helped build the hospital that still exists on the Hill. And uh, he had worked with Morton and accurate predicted four, four or five years before it happened, the stock market crash. He also accurately predicted World War II, even mentioning the Japanese and the Germans as being instrumental in, in the war. Uh, but most of his work, was for individuals. People just like you and I would come for a health problem or a, a relationship issue or how they could improve their intuition or how they could uh, work with having a closer walk with God. And that's really why I think the Casey material is still very popular today because people have the same kinds of questions. So when Edgar Casey was alive, he actually gave readings to just about 5,000 different people, which doesn't sound like very many, but 5,000. And today, <clears throat> on a given Monday, on every Monday is our busiest day. I, I often think that people go back to work and then they come, uh, they go back to work on a, after a weekend and after a little while they get bored and they start surfing the internet. And so every Monday is our busiest day with unique users coming to this work. And every Monday about three times as many people come to us as came to Edgar Casey in his lifetime. Wow. Um... He, he did readings on 10,000 different topics. So, I mean, almost every topic imaginable has been covered at one point, I think. Uh, he also did predictions on world events. Uh, we are living now in 2020, uh, very exceptional times, uh, we may say. Did he do predictions on this year specifically? He, he did not. Well, remember, he only responded generally to questions he was asked. Yes. So nobody ever said what's going to happen in 2020 or what's going to happen in this particular year. But he did give, uh, let's say, thematic overviews of what the future would be like. 
So he suggested that we were headed towards more of a global cooperative world, that uh, our, our free will is going to be how we get there. I mean, we might get there because there's a, a horrendous challenge we have to work together to overcome. But he, he suggested that the world would essentially have a connectedness that we probably couldn't imagine at the time. And there was no such thing as the internet. But I can tell you that my grandparents were never aware of what was going on on the other side of the world. And yet today, whatever happens is broadcast instantaneously. He also suggested that uh, uh, eventually all, all of us would have a much more uh, aware connection to the divine. He also suggested that uh, we would be uh, healthier. We'd be more interested in self-improvement eventually. We'd be more, rather than making money, we'd be more interested in becoming better people. So these are just some of the things he talked about in terms of the, the th themes we're headed for. But nobody ever said what's going to happen in 2020. Mm. Um, did he also talk about artificial intelligence, about our techno uh, technological uh, improvement and advancement? Well, he, did not, he did not talk about computers or about uh, uh, the internet or anything like that. But what he did talk about was that uh, we, we would be it, they, basically, the readings, I usually, in an elevator speech, for example, when someone says, what's the Edgar Casey readings all about? I have this little elevator speech, and I basically say, the 10,000 readings boil down to three things. The purposefulness of life, that regardless of what's happening in your life right now, Casey suggests it has the opportunity to be a purposeful experience. The oneness of God, that with, with God as the creator, all of us are connected in ways we can't even imagine. In fact, Casey suggested that that if science and religion would study the principle of oneness for, for six months, it could transform the world. Because Casey suggested that in all of creation, there's only one being, and that being is God, and that somehow we're all a part of that. He also suggested that we're not humans who happen to have souls, but instead we are spiritual beings who are ha having a physical experience. And our job somehow is to bring divinity into the third dimension. And I often joke with the staff here in Virginia Beach that, that everyone on the earth is actually an employee for God, but the challenge is most of us didn't know we were hired, and those of us that do know are only working part-time. But really, that's why we're here, to somehow bring spirituality into the third dimension and transform it. So um, did, uh, give, uh, did Edgar Cayce give us specific guidelines on how we should live? He did. I mean, for uh, his lifelong dream was to found, find a hospital which uh, where people could come to get readings. One of the challenges w for him was that uh, people would write to him as a last resort. And he might be in Virginia or Kentucky or in Alabama, different places he lived. And they'd write in and ask for help and he'd give them a reading. And then sometimes they'd have a hard time finding a doctor who wanted to carry out the, the information. I mean, you can imagine going to a doctor and say, you know, a man I never met lives a thousand miles away. He fell asleep on a couch, outlined my illness, and here's what I'm supposed to do about it. And Casey was recommending things like a change in diet, change in attitudes and emotions, drawing upon all kinds of schools of medicine. And so there were a lot of doctors hesitant to carry out some of these treatments. And so Casey's dream was to have a hospital where people would come and regular doctors would carry out the treatments and he would give the readings. And Finally, after many, many, many years, I mean, Casey was uh, in his, uh, almost in his 50s when the, when the hospital was finally founded. And then it only operated for 18 months and was closed. And he was depressed to the depths of his soul. And it was really because of that life challenge where he lost the hospital. And a group of friends rallied around him because they were afraid he was very depressed and asked him, you know, one of the questions was, well, how can we become more psychic like you? And he suggested that in a reading that the goal wasn't really to become more psychic, that the goal was to become more spiritual. And as we became more spiritual, we would become more psychic as kind of like a second nature. And so for the next dozen years, he outlined a series of 24 lessons in, in spiritual growth that are now used by people all over the world. But essentially, it's, it's, it boils down to three things. It boils down to working with spiritual ideals, which is essentially to decide what kind of a person you'd like to be a better person, a, a better loving person, a more forgiving person, a more compassionate person, and try to become that kind of person. So it's spiritual ideals. It, it boils down to attunement. 
in the Western world, he was one of the first individuals to recommend meditation and prayer and working with affirmations constantly. Uh, and it boils down to application, to, to do what you know to do. Uh, Casey often has a phrase in the readings, do what you know to do and the next step will be given. I mean, a lot of us think we're right here and we want to go here and we just want to get there. Casey suggested you actually have to do one step at a time to get to the next level. So, so it is one really of the things we do here uh, is actually we, we teach people how to work with their dreams. We teach people how to be more intuitive. We teach people how to meditate. So everything Casey talked about in terms of becoming a, a, a more full human being in the earth, that's one of the things we do here when people come. Um, Kevin, I have one of your books here, uh, the best dream book ever. Okay. Uh, um, I loved it. I have, um, and um, the question I had, but you answered it in a way, but I still want to ask uh, the question, uh, why did he have to sleep in order to do his reading? So you just said it was because of, you know, things he did in past lives, uh, right. that he wasn't, he couldn't be conscious while he was doing the readings. But but I, I do want to say that later on, I mean, as he got older, and especially towards the end of his life, he became much more psychic in the waking state. So he would see auras all the time, which is the, the colored lights around people that can give you an indication of what they're thinking, their energy, that kind of thing. He could become aware of people's past lives just by looking at them. He could uh, uh, have basically a visual overview of what was about to happen to that person that day. So he did become more psychic in the waking state later on. Um but uh, you, you, you could say that um, all of us um, receive intuitive information in our dreams. That's, that's what your book is about, the best dream book ever. Yes. Um, so um, it seems to be that if we are sleeping, um, our conscious awareness is uh, you know, not working and it seems to be easier to receive intuitive information. So I thought maybe that's also a reason why uh, Edgar Casey had to uh, sleep um, while he did his readings. Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that challenges us, most of us, is uh, when we're trying to get intuitive information is our, uh, is our conscious mind. I mean, we have, we have wants, we have fears, we have concerns. And so it's really hard to get an accurate psychic input on something that we already have our own uh, parameters about. And so what happens when we sleep is the conscious mind gets set aside and the subconscious mind comes to life. And the, the subconscious mind is actually much larger in terms of data than the conscious mind. Science has proven that of the 100% of the data stimulus coming to you, the conscious mind filters out more than 95%. I mean, right now, you don't feel your hand on your face, unless I point out you don't feel your shirt on your body, your, your uh, bottom on your chair, your feet on the floor, any of that, because it, it would be, you'd be on sensory overload if you became aware of everything going on around you. But what, what happens when you sleep is all that data is available. And so you can pick up on things that you saw during the day with maybe slight conversations, uh, body language, things you weren't even aware that you were aware of. In fact, that's why that people who are hypnotized after being at a crime scene remember more under hypnosis than they were aware of consciously. And so this subconscious mind opens up and provides a lot more data. But Casey went a step further and suggested that when that happens, uh, our superconscious mind, which is probably closely connected to what Carl Jung would call the collective unconscious, actually taps into other minds and we can pick up on one another. And at that level, we also dream about the future. In fact, he suggested, Casey suggested, that nothing of significance ever happens to us without it first being foreshadowed in a dream. And all of us are constantly dreaming the future. When I tell people that, they say, well, I've never dreamed the future. But then I ask them this question. I say, have you ever had the experience where you're driving somewhere and you think, wait, wait a minute, I've, I've already driven here before. Or you're having a conversation with someone, you think, wait a minute, I've already had this conversation. And we have an experience called deja vu. Casey would say that very often, the night before something happens, we dream about it. If Kevin does this, here's the outcome. If Kevin goes sees his friend, here's the kind of conversation they're gonna have. We, have, we dream about it before it happens. And then when it does happen, what's really happening is we're having fragmentary dream recall. And that's what most deja vu is. An experience happened in our subconscious mind. We go through it the next day and we have this aha moment. And Casey would suggest that if we actually kept track of our dreams, we'd have a lot more experiences with personal intuition. 
And as the book that you, you pointed out a minute ago suggests, I've become very fond of writing out questions. You know, what kind of a question would you like to have an answer to? Write out the question, read it before going to bed, and then watch your dream. And you would be amazed at how often you can get valid psychic information in that way. I, I, I think this is very important what you're saying right now. Um, I, uh, there's a researcher in, in, uh, in Holland, um, and he, uh, prom he, he was doing his promotion on dreams, actually. And he said that if you focus on a question 15 minutes right before you go to, to sleep, then, you, you know, you will receive uh, an answer. Maybe not, you know, right away, but if you, you know, stay with it, uh, you will receive an answer. But he pointed out that you needed to focus for 15, one, five minutes on it not just a minute or something um is it also your experience that you need to give it a little bit more time a little bit more focus than just uh, well uh, obviously the the more you focus the more your mind knows you're serious i have never sat there and timed myself 15 minutes but what i have done is i have written out a question and either held it in my hand or put it under my pillow or tuck it in my undershorts and keep it with me all night and I've done that hundreds of times. And I can tell you that, I mean, I just did it recently again. Anything you want information about can come to you. Uh, let me give you the one example. When I was at a, uh, uh, when I was at a program in uh, Georgia a number of years ago, uh, I had a group of maybe 100 people and we were working on our dreams and we were staying for two nights. And so I suggested to the audience that we should all work on the question, what do I need to work on spiritually? So I wrote out that question and I dreamed on, I looked at it before I went to bed. And this is the dream I had. I was in an old city and I knew it was an old city because they had dirt streets and they had plywood, plank wood sidewalks. And I'm walking along these plank wood sidewalks and I can hear my feet going clickety, clickety, clickety. And I'm walking next to a very tall man in a, in a hat and an overcoat wearing glasses and I look again and I realize I'm walking next to Edgar Casey, and I'm in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, which is where he was born. So as we're walking along in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, I look at Mr. Casey and I said, so how am I doing? And remember I'd written out, what do I need to work on spiritually? I said, well, so how am I doing? And he kind of looked over his glasses like this and he said, well, Kevin, you do know you spend more time watching TV than meditating. And that was the end of the dream. So I woke up thinking, that, that, that's such a great answer. Casey wants me to meditate more. What do I need to work on spiritually? More meditation. And, you know, it is that simple sometimes to get a, a valid answer. And sometimes in your dreams, uh, you can get answers you didn't even know you were looking for. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just an amazing process. There's two things I would like to say about that. Um, my experience is that um, I have a lot of precognition uh, in my dream so I, I dream dream something and then it happens the next day and most of the time it is an event that's not uh, very important um, sure. I, I also dream about um, very important events I dream about them before they happen but sometimes you really dream about you know let's say um, sometimes al almost ridiculous uh, stuff why is that is that just uh, little synchronicities, little confirmations that uh, you have uh, grown spiritually? Well, I, I think that in part it's to, re to uh, for lack of a better word, prove to the individual that you're much more intuitive than you might believe or that you're might much more connected than you believe. But it also suggests that when we keep having small mini psychic experiences, it's, it's suggesting that we're, we're not using our empathy or our compassion as much as we have available to us in the waking state. And so empathy and compassion comes out as intuition when we're asleep. So lots of times people who are confined to an office or they have a job that keeps them on the computer or whatever, they don't have a lot of human interactions that lets them express empathy to other people. Empathy suppressed comes out as intuition. That's mm. been my experience. Mm. The other thing is because I, I, I use your book a lot. So whenever I have a dream, I, I take your book and I'm, then I, I look, okay, what did uh, Kevin say about this, uh, right? <laughs> Kevin, I would like to go to another book of yours, um, Edgar Casey on the Akashic Records. Uh, okay. I mean, we can say that Edgar Casey tapped into the Akashic Records every time when he was doing a reading, right? He did, yep. Yes. Can you explain to our audience what are the Akashic Records? Sure, the, the way I kind of visualize it, if you can imagine the earth, that there is this etheric invisible force field, let's say around the earth, 
uh, that's like an energy field, and that everything that happens in the earth, every thought, every word, every deed, is kind of transcribed in this energy field. Uh, it's my call it the mind of God, or you might call it the universe's supercomputer system. Uh, and as unusual as that might sound, the, the Bible calls it the book of life, or God's book of remembrance. And uh, everyone probably has heard about a near-death experience, where where someone dies and then they have often part of that process is they have a life review and then they're reawakened. But when they had the life review, they got to see all of their life unfold before them, all the things that they did. What they're actually doing is they're tuning into their Akashic records of their own soul journey and they're getting to see the record that they've written. Uh, so that record is there, but it's not only a record of the past, it also creates probable futures. Like I just said, like if, if someone does this, here's the outcome. If someone does this, here's the outcome. And we constantly pick up on these patterns from the past, and they are really memory patterns. That's really all karma is, is memory patterns. So we pick up on these memory patterns from our own Akashic record. We meet people, and you know, sometimes we have the experience where we meet someone for the very first time, we really like that person, or we meet someone for the very first time and we don't care for that person at all. And what we're tuning into is our own Akashic record experience with that person or a person very much like them. So we take these memory patterns with us and uh, they really become a, a part of the soul's journey and our job, if Casey's correct, is to transform those negative patterns into positive ones and really become, for lack of a better word, a Christ in being. Mm. So Casey um, was able to tune into anyone's record, see their past lives, their patterns, their strengths, their weaknesses, and it, it's actually things we all pick up on in our own life. Kevin, could we say that everyone... Um, comes uh, into the world with a specific blueprint. Um, and, I mean, uh, a fish cannot drown in, in, in water and uh, the purpose of a bird is to fly. Um, I, in another life, uh, in, in this lifetime, actually, I, uh, I was a lawyer, but I felt it was not my, uh, my, my element, if, 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 yeah. if you will. Um, do we all have uh, uh, an element? Was Edgar Cayce supposed to be the psychic in that lifetime? And are you supposed to be the executive uh, director of ARE in this lifetime? Are you on track? Are you living your, 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 your blueprint? Well, uh, I'm not certain I would get into saying you absolutely have to have this particular job. But I do think that your, your blueprint suggests you're going to be, uh, I think one of the things I'm supposed to be involved in is communication about, about uh, metaphysics, about spirituality. And so maybe in this life, it, it happened to be, because I get to be at ARE and I get to work with the case material, and I get to write and I get to get, give lectures. So the, the blueprint is about communication of spiritual values. How it manifested was here at this place and this work. So I'm not sure the, the lines of specificity. In your own case, I would say that in all likelihood, you were a lawyer in a past life, and that was something that was kind of a part of your thought processes. And it just, it's a pattern from the past, but you picked it up in the present, and there's something else for you to do. So yes, we all have blueprints. We also all have memory patterns that we bring with us. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story about my son. Uh, he, when he was about one, my wife and I, his bedroom was on the second floor and his crib had very tall bars on it. And we'd be down in the kitchen and in about a dozen different times, he would pull himself out over the crib and throw himself on the floor. And it was about a six foot drop. And then he started screaming because he hurt himself. So I'd run up and pick him up. And I told my wife, he's going to hurt himself if he keeps doing this. Uh, and my wife is pretty intuitive. And she said, well, let me sit in here and see what he's doing. And uh, she came back, back down about 15 minutes later and she said, I'm picking up on a past life in France. And when he was in France, this is a couple hundred years ago, he was arrested by the sheriff for something he did not do. And the sheriff came and picked him up in a wooden, like a cage drawn by horses that looked almost exactly like the crib. And so he's waking up, he's remembering being in that cage, he's thinking, I've got to get out and throws himself out of the cage. That's what my wife came up with. <clears throat> well, I thought to myself, I'll make it into a day bed. So I took all the bars off and he never jumped out of the bed again, which I thought was interesting. But what was even more interesting was four years later when we went to kindergarten, we were in the orientation for kindergarten and the teacher talked about how when all the kids were well-behaved, they had their name on the little car 
and the car was on the wall and it could stay on the track. But if they misbehave, she'd take the car off the track and put it in the shop as a sign to everyone else that the kid did something wrong. Well, when we got back out to the car, Tyler was horrified and he kept saying over and over and over again, what if someone else does something and I get blamed for it? What if someone else does something? And, I, and he was horrified by that. And we had never told him about my wife's experience. So I, and we had to work with him that for that uh, for a long time about, you know, it's okay if someone does something and you get blamed for it, we'll work it out with you, not a problem. But it was, it was a pattern of memory he brought with him that really scared him. And I think that happens to all of us. We bring in these patterns of memories, these talents, and all that is part of the Akashic Records. Wow. Um, is it uh, possible for all of us to tap into that? Because on, on the one hand, we have um, the option to receive intuitive information in our dreams. Uh, yes. We can also meditate. Uh, what are the best options to uh, tap into the Akashic Records? Well, after being involved here for 45 years, I have become convinced that everyone taps into the Akashic Records. They just don't know that that's what they're doing. And ultimately, because the Akashic Records is the source of all information, anytime we have a psychic experience, whether it's from a dream or just a psychic hunch, I think ultimately it's coming from the Akashic Records as well. So we all tap into the Akashic Records. We just don't know that's what's happening. There are ways to become better at that and to practice and as you know from that book i'm fond of doing psychic games you you play psychic games and the more you play them the easier it is to get information so so what do you mean by psychic games so what, one of the things that we, we do at my house is is let's say that uh let me just make up a question. Let's say that I, I'm wondering about whether or not I should take a trip somewhere right now, if it's safe to take a trip because of COVID-19. So I might write on a piece of paper, is it safe for me to take a trip right now? Yes. But because I have worries about COVID-19, because I'm kind of concerned, it's going to be really hard for me to get psychic information on that. So what we'll do instead is I'll write out my question on a piece of paper, and my wife will write out a question she has. And then we fold the pieces of paper up into little pieces so we don't know whose is whose piece of paper and we mix them up and then we each take a piece of paper in our hand and then we imagine something like imagine opening a package or imagine uh, going to a movie or imagine reading a book what's the book and we write, write down everything we can see in our mind on this piece of paper and over and over and over again you'll be very amazed at how the thematic content of what you're seeing answers the question that's the kind of psychic game I'm okay. talking about. So um, <clears throat> when Mozart um, was five, he could play the piano. Yeah. Um, he was a prodigy. We could say that Edgar Casey was also a prodigy. And you, you pointed out that um, his intuitive psychic powers, he developed that through you know, many different lifetimes. Um, and, and Mozart probably did the same thing with music. Yes, I mean, exactly. We, so that, we take our talents with us. Yeah. Yes. So that's that's my point. So you you have people that come in um, at a very very early age, and they show um, you know a talent in a certain field uh, in a in a certain area. You you can really see oh you know this this is not something they uh, this is something they they basically came into this world with. Um, there are also uh, stories um, like uh, Uri Geller. Um, the you know Uri Geller became mm -hmm. famous, uh, I think, in the 70s because of his spoon bending. But he has also been been researched um, at uh, SRI, Stanford Research Institute, by by people like Hal Putoff and Russell Tark, and even Stephen Schwartz. Um, and um, Uri Geller um, said that he was always a normal. Uh, person until um, he was abducted by a UFO and um, he uh, he changed because of that and um, they probably uh, you know gave him an upgrade and mm -hmm. since that moment he was able to do uh, certain things like spoon bending but he was also able to get intuitive information um, so um, and, and there are other stories so Uri uh, shared with me that uh, Ingo Swan who is uh, together with Russell Tark and, and I'll put up the, the father of, of, of remote viewing um, was also abducted by a UFO and um, that 
maybe caused him to become the great uh, remote viewer that he was. Uh, did Edgar Casey uh, talk about uh, aliens and also their their influence uh, on, on 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 humanity? Well, let me first say that Edgar Casey sometimes is called like one of the first remote viewers because very often when he'd give a reading, yeah. he would tune into the person. He might say something like. Uh, uh, they're wearing funny pajamas, or uh, there's a, a really nice car in the front yard, or uh, what a pretty tree on the corner. So somehow his mind traveled to wherever he was giving the reading to tune into the person. And yeah. we've got all that documented. Lots of times people would say, yeah, I had put on brand new red pajamas for the reading, and you know, just humorous things like that. But keep in mind, Casey generally only responded to questions he was asked. Yes. So it wasn't really until the 1940s, late 40s, that the phenomena of UFOs even started coming up. So nobody asked him about aliens. Nobody asked him about UFOs. That said, there are three readings that talk about uh, vehicles from other places. And it, it's unclear whether he's talking about other dimensions or other planets or even maybe something Atlantean. But there are three readings that talk about vehicles from other dimensions or pl pl planets or places but nobody asked him specifically about aliens. Mm. So uh, this month I will have Dr. Stephen Greer on my show. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Stephen Greer. Um, and um, he said, uh, you know, he's communicating with aliens. He made uh, a film about it. Um, it's, it's on Netflix. Um, and he is saying that what the, the, the aliens he's communicating with uh, want is that we evolve spiritually. That's their primary intention for us, that we evolve spiritually. That's also what Edgar Cayce said. We are here to, to, to work on our spiritual uh, growth. It exactly. seems that the aliens are way ahead of us spiritually. You know, they, 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 they work with telepathy. Um, so... Um, it is interesting that you know people like Uri Geller and Ingo Swan had uh, alien encounters, and um, in a way, it, it improved their uh, psychic uh, skills. And so, so and, and, and 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 with Casey, uh, it didn't happen uh, because of uh, an encounter with uh, with with uh, aliens. He just uh, built this up gradually over um, you know many lifetimes. But I think it's really interesting uh, that we live uh, in a time where more and more information is coming out. And uh, the primary intention uh, that aliens have for us is that we work on exactly what you are doing with ARE. Uh, sure. And, and, you know, interestingly enough, I don't know if you see some of the US new, USA News, but yesterday the Pentagon announced that so many uh, military aircraft are seeing UFOs that they're launching a new group of the Pentagon to start investigating the UFO phenomena. It was just announced yesterday. So I do think UFO sightings are going to become more and more frequent. And it could be that uh, aliens are a little concerned that we're on the verge of wrecking havoc on the universe and we need to uh, you know, practice being more spiritual, learning how to love one another, I mean, whatever it is. But yeah, I, I do believe in UFOs. Yeah, but it makes sense. It makes sense because if we're all one, uh, right. we should live from that perspective, right? Absolutely. Um, it, it's what Jesus said, it's what Yogananda said, it's what the Buddha said, it's what Edgar Cayce said. It's all the same. Um, talking about the Buddha and Jesus, um, obviously Jesus was important to Edgar Cayce, but did he also talk about uh, the Buddha in his work, in his readings? He did, and, and I think that, uh, you know, as soon as we, we start talking about Jesus or we talk about Buddha, we get into... Uh, you know, which denomination is better or which, which religion did Edgar Cayce think is the best? And, and I think his perspective is a little different. His perspective is that we are all spiritual beings and that religion was created really for the community we share with one another. But, but God doesn't care what religion we are. And that ultimately, you, his goal, you need to reach perfection, is what Casey would say. You can reach perfection as a Buddhist, you can reach perfection as a Hindu, you can reach perfection as in Islam, you can reach perfection as a Christian. That's not important. What's important is how we apply spiritual material in the earth and how we uh, treat one another and how well we attune to our connection to the divine. All that said, Casey would say that we essentially have two, two ways to make it. We reach perfection in the earth, 
Or we come to the earth and we learn the lesson of unconditional love, and then we move on to other spheres or dimensions to reach perfection. He did say that Jesus was the first soul to reach perfection in the earth and therefore became a pattern for every soul in the earth. But he did not say Jesus did that because he was a Christian or he did that because he was a Jew. He did it because he was the first one to make, actually do it. And unfortunately, uh, I often say that, unfortunately, the religious right has kidnapped Jesus and made him into something he really wasn't. Uh, but Casey would say Jesus is really our elder brother, the elder brother for all religious movements. He also said that the Christ spirit sat with Buddha during his meditations. Uh, I think he would say that the, the spirituality of the creator manifests anytime there's an awareness of the, the oneness of God and our connection to one another. Beautiful. Kevin, thank you so much um, for the first 45 minutes. After the break, I would like to talk a little bit more about Jesus.